Hello everyone, I'm Kai, and welcome to this lecture on the Orthodox Shahada Discord server. The topic is Ghazali on the Divine Attributes. Moderation in belief, in Arabic, Al-Iqtisad fil Etiqad, is one of Ghazali's most famous books. While it covers several themes, it is most prominently known for being an authoritative exposition on Ashari Kalam, specifically the Ashari conception of the divine attributes, as well as occasionalism. The book is divided into four overarching parts, or treatises. The first treatise covers core doctrinal issues with respect to God, namely the existence of God, that God is eternal, that God is not a body, that God is not located in a direction, and so on. The second treatise discusses the primary attributes of God, how to properly understand what they encompass, what they all have in common, how they relate to the essence, etc. The third treatise discusses the acts of God, basically how he relates to creation, for example, the sending of messengers, rewarding and punishing people, and so on. The last treatise discusses some ancillary things, like the supposed prophethood of Muhammad, and who was to be considered a heretic, and some other things. My focus in this lecture series will be largely on the second treatise of Ghazali's work. While I aim to give a detailed survey of what Ghazali writes, it's not my aim to be excessively pedantic and present every single thing he says. For that, you can read the relevant sections of the book yourselves. The aim of this lecture series is to just familiarize you in a broad way that the, what the normative Ashari position is with respect to the attributes as exposited by Ghazali, such that when you engage Ashari Muslims, you have a working knowledge of the attributes. That said, Ghazali isn't the only source one should be aware of on the topic but he is a good first step to learning the normative position before moving on to other works in order to round out a more exhaustive treatment on the subject. Some examples of other books that are good follow-ups uh, to Ghazali, and this by no means is an exhaustive list, are Taftazdani's commentary on Aqid Nasafiyah, a refined explanation of the Sanusi Creed by Sheikh Said Fuda and also by Sheikh Said Fuda, his commentary on Aqidah Tahawiya. Ghazali identifies seven primary divine attributes. Power, or Qudra, Knowledge, or Elm, Life, Hay, or Haya, Will, Irada, Hearing and Seeing, Samiya and Basar, and these two attributes very frequently are lumped together almost as an inseparable pair. And then the seventh, speech, or kalam. Though all the primary attributes eternally coexist with each other, there is an ontological hierarchy, but not in the sense of causality, i.e. one primary attribute does not cause the existence of another attribute. So let me illustrate the point with an example. You, as a human being, can be attributed with life, will, knowledge, power, hearing, seeing, and speech. Of all these attributes, life has ontological priority in that it is a necessary condition for all the other attributes. If you are not living, then you do not have will, knowledge, power, hearing, seeing, and speech. So being alive, or living, is a necessary condition for these other six attributes. However, being alive is not a sufficient condition for them, meaning that, for example, just because you are alive does not mean that you have knowledge or that you can speak. Now, as a human being, one develops throughout the course of their life, so they come to acquire knowledge, which is not the case with regards to God who knows everything eternally by virtue of being God. The point is that, metaphysically, life has ontological priority to all the other attributes. Similarly, the exercise of power necessitates the exercising of will. So, will has ontological priority over power, meaning that it is an essential condition for power. 
That said, these attributes being perfect in God mean they do not change. For example, God does not grow in knowledge or learn to speak. God eternally knows everything and is eternally capable of speech. All the attributes coexist eternally, meaning that there was never when a, when God was devoid of any of his primary attributes, or that there was an ontological change in any of his existing attributes. Nevertheless, metaphysically, there is an ontological hierarchy. Now, there is an analogy that St. John of Damascus in Orthodoxy uses to demonstrate atemporal causality, which can be useful here for illustrative purposes. Consider the example of fire. You have flame, light, and heat. There is never when the flame is that light and heat are not. Likewise, there is never when light and heat are that the flame is not. All must coexist together. However, the flame is a sufficient condition for light and heat, meaning that it is the cause of light and heat, but does not exist independently of them, though they are all distinct. St. John uses this analogy to explain the monarchical doctrine of the Holy Trinity, namely how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally coexist with each other, but yet the Father is the atemporal cause of the Son and Holy Spirit. Now, a word of caution, be careful not to use this analogy of St. John to demonstrate that the Father is a sufficient condition for the Son and Holy Spirit. The idea that St. John is stressing is how you can have a temporal causality, i.e. multiple eternal divine persons, yet only one of them has the hypostatic property of aseity. My use of the analogy here is meant to tie into the Islamic divine attributes to show how multiple things can be co-eternal ontologically, yet have some kind of relational asymmetry between them that is inherent in the manner of their ontological existences. The first attribute Ghazali talks about is power, or qudra. He introduces it using the intelligent design argument. Basically, that the world being a well-designed and well-ordered marvel can only come about as a result of an agent enacting a power to produce such a product. He immediately follows up his assertion that we know the world to be well-designed, well-ordered, excellently organized, excellently composed, and exact through sensation and observation. In other words, he makes a basic appeal to natural theology, namely that we use our natural senses to conclude that there is an agent who produced the world. One thing to notice is that Ghazali hasn't yet explicitly identified this agent as God. He will do so momentarily, but his assumption is that the world cannot come into existence by any other means. He now shifts to a different question. How do we know the agent is powerful? To which he answers that we know from reason without requiring a so-called proof. But nevertheless, he will give a quote-unquote proof. It's at this point he identifies the power being discussed as being God's power, i.e. identifying the agent as God. He says that acts that proceed from God must proceed either through his essence or through something additional to his essence. He immediately excludes the essence on the grounds that it would mean the act coexists eternally with the essence, leading him to conclude that the act proceeds through something additional to the essence. This additional something is what he identifies as the attribute of quote-unquote power. The attribute is what allows the agent to be prepared for an act and then bring that act into fruition. With regards to a potential objection that the attribute is eternal, yet the act is not, he defers to the section on the attribute of will, which he discusses later. Ghazali now goes through and describes the general characteristic of the attribute of power which is that it attaches to objects of power, 
i.e. all possible things, meaning that power is necessary in order for possible things to come into existence. And since it is possible to have infinite things, the objects of power are infinite. Now, he qualifies infinite to be understood as meaning that there is no limit to the successive creation of one occurrence after another. In other words, possibility continues forever, and power encompasses all of that. What the Ghazali is referring to is potential infinity, not actual infinity, the latter of which he rejects. He's basically saying that whether or not creation is realized, there is no limit to the divine power to bring about creation. He now goes on to discuss why there's only a single power responsible for every object of power and why every object of power cannot have its own independent power, i.e. why there can't be infinitely many powers. Without getting into the nuances, he boils it down to the fact that every object of power has one thing in common, possibility. This commonality is what allows him to conclude that every object of power must then be realized directly through the singular attribute of power. Ghazali then discusses three questions raised with regards to power. The first question is, if the contrary of what is known is an object of power. Now, that which is possible is an object of power. That which is impossible is not an object of power. So Ghazali really wants to answer if the contrary of what is known is possible or impossible. And this hinges on correctly understanding what is meant by possible and impossible, failing which one can conclude contradictory positions. He also frames possible in a different way as not impossible. So you have impossible and not impossible. He gives the example of God's will to create the world. There are three possible conditions relating to God's will to create the world. That the world is one, necessary, two, impossible, or three, contingent. Basically, if God wills to create the world, then the world exists necessarily. If God does not will to create the world, then it is impossible for the world to come into existence, i.e. you cannot have an occurrence without a cause. And if God does not will to create the world, then he cannot ever will to create it. This third conditional with respect to contingency needs a bit of unpacking. What Ghazali is trying to get at with regards to contingency is to examine the world in terms of its essence absent of God's will. If it is possible for a world to exist according to its essence, then it is impossible for it to not exist according to its essence, as it would be a contradiction for the world's existence to be possible or impossible according to essence. Its non-existence, therefore, necessitates something other than itself. It is in this latter sense that the world is both possible and impossible. Ghazali follows this up with an example in an attempt to answer the initial question, i.e. the contrary to what is known. If it's part of God's knowledge that Zaid is going to die on Saturday morning, then is it possible or impossible for the creation of life for Zaid at that time? Ghazali answers in the affirmative for both. It is possible in virtue of essence, specifically essence of life, and impossible on account of something other than essence, namely God's knowledge, or quite simply knowledge. The impossibility cannot be negated because then knowledge would turn into ignorance, which itself is impossible. As an object of power, life for Zaid is not impossible. And herein is Ghazali's answer. The object of power 
attaches to only the essence. Ghazali affirms that the contrary of what is known is not an object of power insofar as it means that its existence leads to an impossibility. Ghazali now moves on to the second question. This upcoming part of the treatise touches on one of the most important topics in all of Asharism, namely occasionalism. It's in this section that we get an undeniable formulation of occasionalism as the correct metaphysical paradigm for Sunni Islam. The question is framed as follows. Given that the divine attribute of power universally attaches to all things, are the objects of power of animals and all created life also objects of God's power or not? Rephrased, Ghazali is asking, does secondary causality exist? However, the way Ghazali unpacks secondary causality is not from the perspective of whether or not objects of power can ever exist that are not under immediate divine influence. Rather, he presents us with the following two options. If, on the one hand, such objects of power can exist, then this is a contradiction of what was already established, namely that God's power universally attaches to all things. On the other hand, it is absurd to posit an object of two powers, divine and created. On this basis, Ghazali rejects power for created beings, but immediately recognizes there is a potential problem. How then do you make sense of Quranic injunctions for people to do such and such? In other words, it would seem as if God is saying that it is incumbent for us as humans to do that which is exclusively within only God's power. To address this supposed problem, Ghazali discusses the positions of various sects with regards to their conceptions of power. He mentions first the Mujbira, or more commonly known as the Jabriya. This group ascribed every action to God such that man has absolutely no independence in any sense. God does, God does and controls everything in creation. So the Jabriya hold the strongest form of determinism. Ghazali then names the Mu'atazilites, who are in complete opposition to the Jabriya. The Mu'atazilites denied that God's power attaches to the acts of certain elements within creation, namely people, animals, angels, jinns, and devils. God has no power over whatever originates and proceeds from them. He can neither prevent nor originate anything from them. Now, just a side note, Ghazali does not discriminate between different degrees and nuances found among the various Mu'atazilite schools. He lumps all of them together as a single group in complete contradistinction to the Jabriya. We can only speculate as to why he does this, but following his train of thought, it's reasonable to conclude that for him, God's utmost sovereignty of action must be preserved above all else. Even the slightest trace in limiting God's power in any way whatsoever, no matter how minuscule, is unacceptable. Mu'atazilism is Mu'atazilism for Ghazali. Degrees don't matter. For example, think of a failing grade. It matters not one bit if the score is 1 out of 100 or 49 out of 100. Both result in the same grade that is a fail. That one fails harder than the other is a meaningless statement. The point is that one did not pass. And now Ghazali makes a massive, monumental, bold claim that the position of the Mu'atazilites is a denial of the consensus of the early Muslims. And here Ghazali uses the term Salaf in Arabic, that there is no creator or originator except God. In other words, 
Ghazali asserts that occasionalism is the doctrine of the Salaf. While the Jabriya do not adequately address the divine injunction with regards to actions by creatures, leading Ghazali to reject their position as absurd, as a form of occasionalism, it, unlike the Mu'tazilites, at least preserves God's utmost sovereignty. This idea that the Salaf accepted occasionalism as the correct Islamic position is an absolutely central claim of Asharism and is one of the most important points of contention between the Asharis and the Mu'tazilites. How historically accurate Ghazali was in his assessment as to what the Salaf believed is not the focus of this lecture. I am merely conveying what Ghazali himself believed with regards to the Salaf. That the Ashari doctrine of occasionalism was adopted as the normative Sunni position is not debatable. We even see it prominently in certain elements of fiqh, for example, in the Shafi'i manual of Islamic law known as Reliance of the Traveler, namely elaborating what constitutes incorrect belief that can result in capital punishment. Now, you will often hear Muslims say that matters of aqidah, such as occasionalism, have nothing to do with fiqh, and that a Muslim is free to accept or reject this worldview without any consequences. What individual Muslims personally do with regards to their Islam in these matters is their business, but suffice it to say, one can easily and readily find the codification within fiqh texts of the necessity to adhere to an occasionalist paradigmatic worldview. Therefore, those who engage in apologetics against Islam, they are wholly justified in treating those Muslims who don't adhere to occasionalism as deviants of the historical normative Sunni position. But getting back to Ghazali, he identifies a second problem with the Mu'tazilite position, and that is that it is problematic to attribute origination and creation to the power of those who lack knowledge of what they create. For Ghazali, one must know to absolute perfection about that which is the object of power. Since creatures lack this knowledge, no object of power can be under their causal influence. Now, just a side note, this same argument is made by Taftazani in his commentary to Aqidah Nasafiyah. Ghazali gives a lengthy example of bees and honeycombs, and how everything about a honeycomb is just perfect for bees, yet bees have no knowledge of their actions to produce such a marvel. The point he's making is that if one cannot fathom what is necessary at the macro scale with regards to knowledge, then one cannot make the requisite actions at the micro scale to achieve the intended result observable at the macro scale. Those who cannot grasp this, namely the Mu'tazilites, observe their activity at the micro scale with only partial knowledge and are deceived to think that they have powers independent of God. Taftazani even comments that some consider the Mu'tazilites to be committing shirk because in taking themselves to have power alongside God's power, they appropriate to themselves a divine attribute. It's at this point that Ghazali presents us with a solution. The problem of a single object being under the influence of two distinct powers is only problematic if the two powers attach to the object in the same manner. However, if the two powers are different and attached to the object in different manners, then there is no problem. Ghazali is about to introduce us to the Ashari notion of kesp, or iktisab, in English, acquisition. Now, just a side note, kesp, or what is acquired, in and of itself is not unique to Asharism. The Mu'tazilites also have a notion of kesp, 
for example, that humans acquire from God the faculty that endows them with the capability to be the source of causal agency. What Ghazali is about to elaborate is specifically the Ashari understanding of Kasp. First, Ghazali gives a quote-unquote proof why a personal power must exist. He does so using the example of a voluntary movement compared to an involuntary one, namely a tremor. And this similar example is also found in Tuftazani. If a person wills to experience a tremor and wills to perform a voluntary movement, for example, moving the hand, then the only difference is the absence of personal power with regards to the tremor and the presence of personal power with regards to the movement of the hand, the volitional movement. In other words, power is what distinguishes the two types of movements. Therefore, some kind of personal power must exist with regards to willed acts. Moreover, since both types of movements are similar occurrence, God's power must attach to both, since the occurrence are identical in the manner in which they exhibit activity, namely, the hand moves back and forth. That one movement is due to a tremor and the other of personal volition is not relevant for their observations, since both are similar occurrence. Therefore, it's not reasonable to say that God's power attaches to one and not the other. This is what presents Ghazali with the conclusion that an object can indeed be subject to two powers and that reconciliation lies in how these two respective powers are understood. Ghazali now addresses the absurdity of the Mu'atazilite position that there is only one power. Given that he demonstrated the necessity for two powers, he entertains the idea of what happens if the person wills to move his hand, but God wills him not to. It's absurd to say that the result is the realization of both wills, as it is impossible for motion and rest to exist simultaneously. It's likewise absurd to say that there is a negation by opposites so that neither motion or rest is realized. And finally, it's also absurd to conclude that God's will overpowers the will of the person since the origination of power is uniform from two sources. This means that there is no preponderance for which power is realized. In other words, it's not a metaphysical tug-and-pull relationship about who has the stronger will. If it were, then God's will would always be realized, which entails that a personal power is just illusory, that in effect there is really only one power, basically ending up with the position of the Jabriya. Therefore, it's inescapable to conclude that two kinds of powers must coexist in some way. Ghazali understands these two powers as follows. God's power is creative in that it is this power that realizes the intended activity, and man's power is inert in that although it attaches to the objects of power, it does not realize the intended activity, but rather acquires and manifests it. In other words, man's power, which ultimately is created for him by God, attaches to the object so that he can manifest its realization, though that realization is a creative act of God. Volitional acts are therefore distinguished from involuntary acts precisely because of the presence of this power, without compromising God's sovereignty. This is why only God is creator and originator, despite that man's power is concurrent with the object of power. So this is the Ashari notion of Kesp. So all Quranic attribution to humans of doing and acting must be understood 
through this understanding of Kesp. Now, some of you might be wondering, is not volition itself an object of power, thereby necessitating God's power attached to it, which means that God also creates the requisite power in man to manifest volition? Yes, it is. So then how exactly does free will exist in Asharism? Because now it seems as if free will is either an infinite regress, which is problematic for obvious reasons, or there really is no free will. If there is no free will, then we're back to square one with the position of the Jabriya. There are various different attempts by Muslims to answer the question of free will, but my focus here is to just stick to Ghazali's treatment and not go into these, these tangents. And Ghazali does not actually go into this discussion. What follows next in Ghazali's treatment is answering the Mu'tazilite objection that man's power cannot be concurrent with the object of power i.e. that man's power must exist before the object of power and that the object comes into existence through that power. I'm not going to elaborate on this. The Mu'tazilite objection basically stems from treating man's power as creative instead of inert and elaborating how that power attaches to the object before it exists. It's really just an example of Mu'tazilites talking past the Asharis and not grasping the Ashari position. This concluding section is really meant for those interested in addressing specific Mu'tazilite criticisms, which is a bit too pedantic for me to go into for the purpose of this presentation. And now Ghazali moves on to address a third and final question in wrapping up his treatment of the attribute of power. The third question is about how can the divine power attach to the totality of occurrence when most movements are generated? For example, the movement of the ring on a hand moves out of a generated necessity when the hand moves and the movement of the hand in water generates movement of the water. This is what we observe and reason proves it. It is impossible to have movement of the ring and movement of the water without movement of the hand. However, if God's power attaches to all occurrence, namely the hand, ring, and water, then it should be possible by an act of God to move only the hand and not the ring and water. Yet, this is impossible, implying impossibility because this is not what we observe and it is contrary to reason. Concluding then that all generated movements are not objects of divine power, thereby contradicting the claim that God's power attaches to all occurrence. In response, Ghazali first wants to clarify the term generate. The Arabic term used is tawallud, which has the connotation of birth. So Ghazali is first trying to understand what the objector means by generate, and he entertains the idea that he is saying that the movement of one occurrent necessarily generates the movement of another occurrent by essence, for example, as a mother would birth a child. But right away, he says this kind of understanding is not correct because there is no such relationship that exists between the hand and ring and the hand and water. It cannot be said that the ring and water proceed from the hand in any way by virtue of essence. So there must be another understanding implied by generation. Moreover, what is observed is that the paired movements are concurrent and generatedness cannot be inferred from that concurrency, let alone be said to be observable. Now, Ghazali addresses a straw man in the objector's position. He says that it is fallacious to say that God would be able to create the movement of the hand without also creating the movements of the ring or water from the vantage point of power attaching to occurrence. What Ghazali is after is to identify that the objector is considering the wrong thing in making his conclusion. Ghazali identifies the necessity for conditions 
and he gives the example of knowledge, will, and life. He says it would not be possible for there to be will without knowledge and knowledge without life, as having will without knowledge and knowledge without life are logically impossible. Therefore, life is necessary for knowledge and knowledge is necessary for will. Ghazali now applies this to the movements of the hand, ring, and water. He says that in order for there to be a movement of a body, the space in which it is to move into must be vacated. If it is not vacated, then you will have a collision of bodies, namely two distinct bodies occupying the exact same region of space. And this is absurd. So just a side note, Ghazali here is alluding to atomic metaphysics. The point that Ghazali is making is that there exists a condition that dictates movements and it's on account of this condition being satisfied that will result in the ensuing observation. In other words, if the hand is to move, the space around it must be vacated. And so the ring and water move as a result, but they do so as objects of divine power and not out of some generatedness. So, Ghazali is framing the issue as one of conditions and not of divine power attaching to all occurrence. Ghazali is now prudent to address the situation of concomitance, namely two acts that are readily observed to occur together but that do not have a manifest condition. And here he briefly mentions the famous example of cotton and fire which he elaborates more fully in his Incoherence of the Philosophers, as well as the example of the feeling of cold when ice touches the hand. His explanation is that our observation in both these cases, namely that the cotton burns and the hand gets cold, are out of divine habit, namely that God decrees that such should be the normal order of things, but that otherwise it is within God's power to not make cotton burn when in contact with fire and to make the hand feel warm instead of cold when in contact with ice. The objector now attempts a different angle by saying that by generate is meant that one thing can be the sole source of power for the movement of another thing. The position being espoused is basically that of the Mu'tazilites, wherein they hold that the power of creatures is creative, meaning that creaturely power, in absence of divine power, can be the source of movement. Ghazali's answer is that this re-clarification does not achieve anything because God's power must universally attach to all occurrence, as already demonstrated, and that generatedness contradicts this. So Ghazali, in his treatment on the attribute of power, basically sums up denial of secondary causation and enshrines occasionalism as the correct doctrine for Sunni Islam. Now, just before I move on to the next attribute, I want to take a moment and cover the example of fire and cotton that Ghazali alluded to earlier. The fleshed-out treatment is in Discussion 17 in his book, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. I also want to supplement that example with another example, which Ghazali gives later in the fourth treatise in Moderation of Belief, i.e. the main text under consideration in this lecture. So, example one of Islamic occasionalism by Ghazali taken from Discussion 17 in Incoherence of the Philosophers. Quote, The connection between what is habitually believed to be a cause and what is habitually believed to be an effect is not necessary according to us. But with any two things where this is not that and that is not this and where neither the affirmation of the one entails the affirmation of the other nor the negation of the one entails negation of the other it is not a necessity of the existence of the one that the other should exist, and it is not a necessity of the non-existence of the one that the other should not exist. For example, 
the quenching of thirst and drinking, satiety and eating, burning and contact with fire, light and the appearance of the sun, death and decapitation, healing and the drinking of medicine, the purging of the bowels and the using of a purgative, and so on, to include all that is observable among connected things in medicine, astronomy, arts, and crafts. Their connection is due to the prior decree of God, who creates them side by side, not to its being necessary in itself, incapable of separation. On the contrary, it is within divine power to create satiety without eating, to create death without decapitation, to continue life after decapitation, and so on to all connected things. Let us then take a specific example, namely the burning of cotton, for instance, when in contact with fire. For we allow the possibility of the occurrence of the contact without the burning, and we allow as possible the occurrence of the cotton's transformation into burnt ashes without contact with the fire. The one who enacts the burning by creating blackness in the cotton, causing separation in its parts and making it cinder or ashes, is God, either through the mediation of his angels or without mediation. As for fire, which is inanimate, it has no action. For what proof is there that it is the agent? They have no proof other than observing the occurrence of the burning at the juncture of contact with the fire. Observation, however, only shows the occurrence of burning at the time of the contact with the fire, but does not show the occurrence of burning by the fire and the fact that there is no other cause for it. And then a little further down, Ghazali continues, the father does not produce his son by placing the sperm in the womb, and that he does not produce his life, sight, hearing, and the rest of the powers in him. It is known that these come to exist with the placing of the sperm, but no one says that they come to exist by it. Rather, they exist from the direction of the first, either directly or through the mediation of the angels. Here first he means God, entrusted with temporal things. It has thus become clear that something's existence with a thing does not prove that it exists by that thing. And now, example two of Islamic occasionalism by Ghazali, taken from the fourth treatise in Moderation and Belief. Quote, We say that anyone among the followers of the Sunnah who believes that God is the exclusive originator, that there is no generation, tawalud, and that no created thing is the cause of a created thing, would say, The Lord exalted as he is the exclusive originator of the conjunction of death and the severing of the head. Hence, supposing the absence of severing does not necessitate the absence of death. This is the truth. He who believes that the severing of the head is a cause and adds to this his observation of a sound body and of no other external cause of death believes that if the severing is absent and there is no other cause, then the effect must be absent too, since all causes are absent. This belief is correct, if it is correct to believe in causation and to restrict all causes to what is known to be absent. Now, just a side note here to clarify what Ghazali is saying. He is talking about the conclusions drawn if secondary causation is true, namely that if there are no other apparent sources of death, then the absence of the action of severing the head will not result in the observable effect of death i.e. that in absence of any other cause for death, the observed effect of death immediately follows as the result of the act of severing the head. Now, Ghazali continues, Therefore, the dispute over this issue is prolonged. Most of the investigators of it do not appreciate its source. Hence, the solution to it must be sought in the canon we mentioned regarding the omnipresence of God's power and the annulment of generation. On the basis of this, 
it must be said about the one who is killed that he died at his predestined time. For this predestined time is the time at which God, exalted is he, created his death. Whether it was accompanied with the severing of the head, a lunar eclipse, the falling of rain, or not, all of these for us are co-occurrence and not causes, but some co-occur repeatedly according to the habitual course of things, and some do not. End quote. So the Ashari belief in occasionalism can be derived from consideration of the divine attribute of power. And that concludes his treatment on that attribute. The next two attributes Ghazali discusses are knowledge and life. He devotes only a small amount of space to them. With, re- with regards to the attribute of knowledge, Elm, he states that God knows all that is knowable, whether existing or non-existing. That which exists encompasses what is eternally existent, meaning the divine essence and divine attributes, as well as what is an occurrent. Ghazali now posits that since God knows about occurrence, then even more so he knows about himself, namely the divine essence and divine attributes. Ghazali is basically recasting the occasionalist idea with regards to power, namely that in order to have creative power, one must have complete knowledge over that which is to be the object of that creative power. And since this applies only to God, him having complete knowledge of all occurrence necessitates that he also have complete knowledge of himself. Furthermore, exhibition of an intelligently designed world, which is the result of creative divine power, can only result if the agent that manifested that power did so in a knowledgeable way. So the quote-unquote proof for divine knowledge goes hand-in-hand with the so-called proof for divine power. Ghazali concludes this section by pointing out that God's knowledge is infinite and he gives as quote-unquote proof the example of doubling numbers, namely 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 ad infinitum. God's knowledge can attach to infinitely many objects of knowledge, just as how God's power attaches to all objects of power. Lastly, Ghazali makes the point that there is only one divine knowledge, not a separate knowledge for each object of knowledge, and remarks that he will come back to address this point once he concludes discussing all the attributes. With regards to the attribute of life, high or hayat, Ghazali literally resorts to simply asserting that its existence is self-evident. How can God know and be powerful yet not living? It is necessary for God to be living in order to know and be powerful. And by living, Ghazali means that God is aware of himself and knows his essence and knows that which is other than himself. Now Ghazali moves on to talk about the attribute of will. Irada. This is an extremely important attribute to understand properly. It is the attribute that Asharism associates with Allah being creator. Power is the instrumental means by which creation comes into effect, but it is will that is responsible for the enactment of that power. That God wills to create is what bestows upon him the title of creator, irrespective of, quote-unquote, when the effect of the world coming into existence is realized. Now, just a side note. Philosophers like Ibn Sina, against whom Ghazali wrote the incoherence of the philosophers, held to an eternal world that emanates from God precisely because for them, there can be no delay between cause and effect. The moment that God willed to create the world, which is causally efficacious, must be immediately followed by the effect, which is the creation of the world. 
Now, since God is eternal, that will to create the world must also be eternal. Therefore, the effect must also be eternal. In other words, the world must have existed eternally. But something that is eternal by definition cannot be created. So the philosophers came up with the idea of emanation. The world eternally emanates from God. Ghazali gets around the problem of emanation by simply asserting that in willing to create the world, God additionally wills when the moment of creation will occur. Now, time is also created, so the notion of quote-unquote moment must be understood in a metaphysical sense to mean that there was when the world wasn't, and then it came into existence. What Ghazali is rejecting is the philosopher's spatio-temporal notion of cause and effect. The creation of the world is not subject to a linear temporal observation of an effect preceded by a cause. Rather, Ghazali is framing the world's creation from the vantage point of God's existence, and anything apart from God is necessarily contingent, namely that there must be when it was not. So the world coming into existence at a specific, as a specific act of creation results from its metaphysical relation to God rather than from a temporal progression originating with a quote-unquote temporal cause followed by a quote-unquote temporal effect. Coming back to the main text, the section on will begins with the claim that God is a willer of his acts. Here, Ghazali will spend some time analyzing how to quote-unquote prove this claim, and the quote-unquote proof is rather ingenuous. Something must give preponderance to God's acts. Now, all divine acts are contingent, meaning that God is not under any obligation to perform any divine activities. I'm not going to cover this specific point here. Those interested can read the third treatise where Ghazali discusses in detail the contingency of all divine activity. Ghazali asks, Is it the divine essence that gives preponderance to the realization of an act? He concludes that it cannot be since the relation of the essence to both opposites is the same, namely whether or not the act is realized. He comes to the same conclusion with regards to power and knowledge. Both power and knowledge attach to the two opposites without any preponderance as to whether an act will or will not be realized. So there must be something else that hasn't yet been considered that makes the realization of the act preponderant. Ghazali identifies this as the divine will. Now, just a side note, For those of you who are not familiar with preponderance language, this basically means to identify a distinguishing quality or characteristic, or perhaps multiple distinguishing qualities or characteristics, that can be the reason for realizing a choice between two things. Think of it like that which tips the scale in favor of one choice over the other. A famous uh, philosophical example is you have a starving horse. Now, I can't remember if the original example uses a horse or some other animal. Um, Anyways, you have a starving horse and you put two bales of hay that are absolutely identical to each other and absolutely identical in their relation to the horse. Absolutely identical in every which way and the horse is equidistant from both bales. Will the starving horse choose a bale from which to eat, or will he die of starvation because he cannot make a choice because of the equality of the bales? If he does choose a bale from which to eat, why did he choose that particular one? So the philosophical question really is whether or not there actually was something preponderant to the bale that made him choose that one in particular, and if so, what? What? 
also, if there wasn't anything preponderant to the chosen Baal, then how do you explain that he made a choice? The point about preponderance is not so much about choosing between opposites, but rather choosing between two objects that have equal metaphysical attachments to the choice. Back to Ghazali. A potential objection is raised, giving the example of motion and rest. Will is attached to both equally, and the object under consideration cannot be both in motion and at rest simultaneously. The object must either be in motion or at rest. A determinant is therefore needed. But then the same issue arises with regards to the determinant, and there would need to be a determinant for it, and so on ad infinitum. So we are faced with an infinite regress problem. To answer this question, Ghazali considers the approaches of four groups, the philosophers, the Mu'tazilites, the Karamites, and the Asharites. The philosophers he dismisses on the grounds that their paradigm necessitates an eternal world, as mentioned before. Their position basically amounts to the world standing in relation to God as light does the sun and shadow does the person. This is an absurd position and need not be considered further. Ghazali goes into a whole side discussion about celestial spheres and some arguments he makes in his Incoherence of the Philosophers against the Philosophers. Um, I'm not going to go into that here as it veers off on too much of a tangent. The Mu'tazilites he dismisses on the grounds that they posit a created will or an occurrent will and especially one that does not occur in any receptacle. The Mu'tazilites, being adherents of absolute divine simplicity and thus rejecting real attributes apart from the essence, would be in the same position as the philosophers as to necessitating an eternal world due to an eternal will. However, they reject the notion of an eternal world, but due to their strict stance on the immutability of God, they prohibit the will from occurring in God. In other words, God cannot be the receptacle for the created will because it is an occurrent and God is immutable. But because it is a divine will, it cannot subsist in other than God. So it is created, but does not reside in a receptacle. Its created existence just is. It exists, but it exists literally nowhere. And Ghazali says this is that this is an incoherent position. If the divine will doesn't subsist in God, then saying he has this will doesn't make sense. Moreover, Ghazali makes another argument against the Mu'tazilites, basically arguing that since the will itself is an occurrent, then perhaps there was another will that preceded this will to bring about the former will, and so on, ad infinitum, essentially another infinite regress problem. The Karamites he dismisses on the grounds that they allowed God to be mutable. Just like the Mu'tazilites, the Karamites believed in an occurrent will, but unlike the Mu'tazilites, they allowed that occurrent will to occur in God. So it follows that if God is a receptacle of occurrence, then God himself is an occurrent, and this is absurd. Lastly, Ghazali puts forward the Asharite position as the correct one, stating that the world occurred when the eternal will attached to its occurrence, without any occurrence of the will itself and without any change in God's eternal state. This specific attachment is the determinant that makes realization of the activity preponderant. Now, Ghazali makes it an explicit point to, stre to stress that asking why the will attaches to the realization of the act and not its opposite, namely no realization of the act, in other words, both are equivalent with regards to possibility, is to ask the wrong question. The whole point of the will is to distinguish between counterparts. It would be like asking, why is knowledge knowledge? Why is power power? 
Why is the possible possible? Likewise, why is will will? Will is precisely to distinguish between counterparts, just how knowledge reveals its object. In other words, the will distinguishes between counterparts because that is its essence. And now Ghazali amplifies the Ashari occasionalist position. If up to this point you weren't convinced that Ashari theology is occasionalist, then here Ghazali spells it out in even more explicit terms. Quote, Every occurrence is originated by God's power, and whatever that power originates requires a will to direct the power to the object and to assign it to it. Hence, every object of power is willed, and every occurrence is an object of power. Therefore, every occurrence is willed. Evil, unbelief, and sin are all occurrence. Therefore, they are inevitably willed by God. Whatever God wills is, and whatever he does not will is not. This is the doctrine of the righteous early Muslims, a salaf salihin and the universal belief of the followers of the Sunnah. End quote. If this isn't occasionalism, then I don't know what is. What is crucial to understand is that one cannot accept Ghazali and Ashrite theology and not be occasionalist. Ghazali clearly demonstrates that the way one is to understand the divine attributes not only is occasionalism inherently built into the Ashrite metaphysical paradigm, but that occasionalism is the paradigm. You cannot have an Asharite theory of divine attributes without adopting an occasionalist metaphysical paradigm. Occasionalism is the engine that drives the entire Asharite metaphysics. So the Christian apologist can use Ghazali to demonstrate how and why Asharite theology must be occasionalist at its very core. The entire doctrine of the divine attributes necessitates occasionalism. The two are inseparable. And then follow up with criticisms of occasionalism itself. For example, the problem of not being able to preserve diachronic identity, which is only one problem among numerous other problems that an occasionalist paradigm has. When you know the arguments, it's a straightforward one-two punch to demonstrate the stupidity of Ashari theology. The intimate connection between the attributes and occasionalism is why all prominent historical Asharis of any importance were occasionalists. They understood the foundation of their metaphysics, unlike some modern-day Muslim apologists who take a buffet-style approach to Aqidah and adopt the so-called quote-unquote Ashari position with regards to the attributes, but then proclaim to take the quote-unquote Athari position with regards to causality. In other words, reject occasionalism and adopt some kind of Mu'atazilite notion of secondary causality. To take the Ashari position on the attributes is to be an occasionalist. Otherwise, the person is contradicting themselves and are too stupid to realize why. Now, just a side note, some might say that Maturidi metaphysics is not occasionalist, yet it is recognized as an acceptable theological school within Sunni Islam. That would be an ignorant statement. Maturidi metaphysics most certainly is occasionalist, as convincingly demonstrated by the Turkish scholar Dr. Nazif Muktaroglu. But it can be difficult to notice because compared to Ashrite metaphysics, it's expressed using slightly different nomenclature. But the underlying framework is occasionalist. There are just some nuances compared to Ashrite theology with regards to ontological categories and what exactly is and is not 
under divine power, which the Maturidis used to give a more explicit understanding of kesp and free will. So, in some respects, Maturidi theology can be seen as extending Ashrite theology, since it covers much of the same ground, doing so in its own way, but then continues on a bit more ahead to provide some answers lacking in the Asharite formulation. But that's a topic for another time. Ghazali next discusses the attributes of hearing and seeing, Sami and Basar. He discusses them together, and for the most part, these attributes are always treated as a pair in general, not just with Ghazali. The first quote-unquote proof Ghazali offers for these attributes is revelation, namely their explicit mentioning in the Qur'an, for example, Surah 42, verse 11. Moreover, in smashing the idols, Ibrahim recognizes that the idols cannot hear or see, as we are told in Surah 19, verse 42. Yet, this same argument is not reflected back onto Ibrahim's God, implying that the Islamic God can indeed hear and see, while the gods of idol worshippers cannot. Ghazali proceeds to examine these two attributes with respect to reason. He addresses the potential objection that even if these two attributes are rejected as occurrence, since God cannot be the receptacle of occurrence, i.e. nothing that is created is done so in God, there is still the problem of eternally hearing and seeing without having anything to hear and see when no occurrence exists or existed. Ghazali gets around this objection by using knowledge as an analogy. If divine knowledge of the world, or properly speaking, the possibility of the world, existed before the creation of the world, and then attaches to the world when it is created, then so too can hearing and seeing exist eternally, absent of any occurrence. Ghazali then follows this up with a very interesting argument. He starts off by affirming God, namely the Creator, is more perfect than anything created. Now, if that which is created is better or improved with hearing and seeing, then how can it not be the case that such would also be the case with regards to the Creator? Ghazali is doing two things here. One, he's using analogia. And two, he's making the case for great-making properties, i.e. that it is intrinsically better for God to possess these attributes than not. He's basically saying that hearing and seeing have a particular meaning for creatures that having them makes them better or perfects them, and lacking them would mean to diminish the creature or make it imperfect. The divine attributes stand in some kind of analogous relation to God that for God to possess them would mean that he is somehow perfected, and hence it is better for God to have these attributes than not. The specific reason as to why hearing and seeing are great making properties is that they contribute to an increase in knowledge. A question is then raised. If hearing and seeing are great making properties, then why not also include smelling, tasting, and touching, namely all the various forms of sense perception, as attributes alongside hearing and seeing? Ghazali's answer is that in principle there is no objection to include them, so long as they are not treated as entertaining corporeal relations with occurrence. In other words, that divine attributes of smelling, tasting, and touching are not dependent on creation. The reason why they are not explicitly numbered among the divine attributes is because there is no Quranic text to identify them as such. In fact, there is a debate among Asharis as to whether or not belief in divine attributes must be restricted to only those which are mentioned explicitly in the Qur'an, or if one can believe in additional attributes, like Ghazali, insofar as they befit the majesty of God. Immediately, a follow-up question is raised. 
What about sensations like pleasure and pain? These are dismissed on the grounds that they stem from deficiencies and as such indicate or necessitate occurrence. According to Ghazali, pleasure can be understood as what occurs after the cessation of pain, or it can be understood as the attainment of something one wants or needs, either case being absurd for God who is already perfect. The point is that these sensations are dependent on occurrence in order to have any kind of meaningful existence, which is not the case with the aforementioned attributes of smelling, tasting, and touching. To have the capacity or capability to smell, taste, and touch, just like to hear and to see, does not necessitate occurrence like other sensations. I'll end today's lecture here. In the next lecture, I'll discuss, God willing, the attribute of speech, or kalam, since Ghazali's treatment of it is a bit lengthy to include it in today's lecture. Also, next time, uh, I will cover, God willing, what all the attributes have in common. Thank you for listening. Peace unto all who are in Christ.